So over the past couple weeks, I spent some time manufacturing or fabricating this knife design that I've had on the drawing boards for a while. And it's going to be a field utility knife. Uh, some people might call it a survivor knife, but I'm going to try and stay away from that nomenclature just because to me, a knife is like a rifle. You know, you can have a precision rifle and some people might call it a sniper rifle, but to me, it really just depends on who is carrying it. So this is pretty much it. Um, I did the best that I could with the materials and resources that I had, but this is made out of 1095 high carbon alloy steel. The blade is about seven inches long and the handle, because I couldn't find a micarta that was this thick, this is actually made out of a, my old Carhartt pants. And what I did was I just took layers of the fabric in resin, laminating resin, and then under a lot of pressure, uh, squeezed them into these panels. So that's pretty cool. But uh, it's 3 16 inch thick, which I think is a great compromise between a blade with a lot of strength and a blade that can still slice. Because we all know that those quarter inch thick knives, unless they have a bevel that goes all the way to the spine, a full fat grind, uh, you're going to be kind of hacking at and butchering whatever you're doing. So I wanted something with a little more finesse, but still had a lot of the strength. And this blade, mind you, is differentially tempered. So if I polished up the blade, you can kind of see it right now, but there's a Hammond line that goes all the way on the edges. Starting from the tip, uh, I have a backup blade. And, you know, I've been thinking long and hard about whether or not I wanted a backup blade. You know, a lot of people don't like backup blades, but in my experience with using knives with backup blades is that it's not too much of um, a restriction or a compromise. I found that either choosing sm slightly smaller logs or pieces of wood to split wasn't very hard to do because, you know, trees come in all shapes and sizes, but also for thicker pieces of wood, batoning on the back end, while it's a little bit awkward at first, is not too steep of a learning curve and you still produce the same results. And to me, it's really important because, you know, after a prolonged field use, and if you don't have a knife sharpener, say if you lost it or just don't carry one, and you can't improvise a stone because you're either in a place where there aren't any stones or the stones are just, you know, not of good quality, they're too coarse or they're too soft, then you're going to want something so that in a last ditch effort, you can still do stuff with it. Now, a little bit further back from the blade, we have this right here. And I've always wanted to have a knife with a wire breaker on it. And the reason for that is, say you come across some man-made material like wire or a fence that you want to get some of the wires out to make a, uh, you know, a tool or you want to use it to make a trap. Well, this is going to help you break through it. And also with this other notch here, uh, this little part helps you score material. So say you found a piece of bone and you want to make some tools and implements out of it, or you want to get into the inside to get the marrow. Well, you could take the bone, score it a little bit, and then smack it with the back of the blade. And what that'll do is create a weak spot in the, in the bone, and then the blow will split it to wherever you want it to. So that's a pretty good feature. A little bit further back is a finger choil, um, or not a finger choil, a thumb ramp. And the thumb ramp that I wanted for this is a little bit forward towards the tip than sort of the conventional ones, because for my hand, it, it just makes sense to put it right there. Too far back, you're, you're kind of holding it in a saber grip. And uh, I wanted it to be as natural as it was for me. Also, the benefit of having it a little bit further and having it in line with the choil is that these two things together can help you lash this particular knife to a shaft to make a spear. Um, a cool thing about this finger choil is that I specifically had this edge right in the finger choil to be a nice hard 90 degrees. So you can put a ferro rod in there and you can really get a lot of sparks. And the cool thing about having it this way is that you can put your tint right there. It's going to be nice and protected from the elements and then you can spark it and start your fire. Of course, I have a finger guard because when it's you know, late, you're tired, your hands are sweaty um, or greasy or something like that, you don't want your blade or your knife sliding up towards the blade. Um, another way to hold this knife is, of course, or two ways, of course you can choke up on the blade like that and you can really get up close to the blade 
for making feather sticks. If you have wet tinder and can't get anything to light a fire, you can do feather sticks. But also, say you just killed an animal and need the meat, and you need to skin the animal first. Well, it's really difficult to, to skin an animal with a long blade such as this. But, you can put your pinky right in the choil, and the thumb ramp actually has a nice grip onto the meat of your hand. And then you just grip the blade with the other parts, uh, with your other fingers, and then all of a sudden, you turn essentially a seven inch blade into about three and a half, four inch blade. So there's a lot more uh, control there. And also the leverage from going like this is not gonna be working on your wrist a lot, okay? So back from the blade, we have the handle scales. Well, like I said before, this is Carhartt Micarta, I guess you could call it. And uh, like all the favorite knives that I have, this one has a fire dimple. And the important thing about this is that if you, by for some reason, have to start a fire by friction, uh, the bow drill is by far, to me, the best method. Um, you know, of course, a lighter ferro rod, anything like that, can save a lot of calories. But having a fire dimple in here saves a lot of calories two ways. One, you don't have to go out and make a handpiece for putting pr uh, downward pressure on the spindle. So that saves, uh, that saves calories right there. But on the second hand, this creates a lot less friction than any piece of wood that you'll find out there. If you're lucky, you might find a little piece of soapstone, but you shouldn't really bank on having that luck. Um, and the knife handle itself is kind of near and dear to me. Um, I kind of designed the shape to kind of fit around the ergonomics of a hand. And if you take your, your index finger and your thumb and make a circle, and look at it for a sec, you'll notice that it's fatter towards here, towards the webbing of your thumb, but it's, a, it's slightly thinner towards this first knuckle of your index finger. And I kind of had that in mind when I, when I shaped this handle. It's steeper right here, but it's shallower right here, so it kind of has that um, kind of teardrop shape. So that, coupled with the curve of the blade, helps you get a lot of leverage. So if you have to do one of these maneuvers, you're not gonna have the blade rolling on you. And these two things also help promote the blade facing in the correct direction because you'll see a lot of beginners that have never used a big knife or chopping before is they might not uh, chop straight down. Their, their blade might be angled a little bit. And especially with knives like K-bars where you have a nice rounded handle, while it may be, uh, I guess, easy to produce, it's not quite as easy to use and also it's a good index for, um, if you're in the dark, you definitely know where your blade's gonna be pointing. On the back of the blade, or the butt end of the blade, sorry, I took a lot of time and thought into the position and the size of this pry bar. Now I wanted a pry bar that was big enough that you can actually use it because some of the knives out there, it's kind of questionable whether or not you can do anything with it because they're so small. But the ones that are big enough, gosh darn, when you try and go into the back seat of that handle, the pry bars usually dig into the meat of your hand. And after a while, that you know it's gonna turn raw or you're gonna bleed, but more likely than not, you're just gonna go into a less efficient position for chopping. So that's pretty much the blade right there. Uh, moving on to the sheath. This is pretty much just a placeholder. Um, I had a lot of material left around from other knives and sheaths that I made. And this is kind of like a Frankenstein of parts. But uh, pretty much it's just, you know, a relatively thin kydex. If I was going to go into production, I would uh, get a, a little bit thicker gauge for you. Um, it's riveted together, and I have Chicago screws that are holding the belt clip on, or the belt loop on. And the reason why I chose leather for this particular one is, one, I like leather, but the only problem is, is that with the carbon blade, there tends to be moisture and rust that's associated with it. But it is easy wearing, so it doesn't uh, wear on your belt, and it is also somewhat grippy, so it's a little bit grippier than nylon or kydex, so it's not going to be sliding around too much. But that's pretty much it. Um, so, a couple things that I'm going to be probably changing is I might change the size and length of the backup blade. I might give you a little more real estate on the spine of the blade, but I also wanted to have um, this blade coated with either a black traction coating or a Cerakote, something of that nature. But let me know what you guys think, and this is the generation one of my fueled utility knife.
Take care out there. Thanks.